May was Mental Health Awareness Month, and we want to keep the conversation going. Construction has the second highest suicide rate by industry in our country, followed closely by ag in fourth place. We're not only passionate about our industry, we're especially passionate about the people that work in our industry. So we reached out to Tony Stevens from the Northwestern Counseling and Support Services to learn more about resources to help others and to help ourselves. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. I really appreciate that and you sharing your expertise. This is a tough topic, yep. um, but I think one that we don't talk about enough. So I'm glad that we at least get to start this conversation and hopefully it will help people that, you know, do view or hear us mm -hmm. um, at Absolutely. some point. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and have the conversation. Absolutely. Um, so with suicide rates being so high in the construction and ag mm -hmm. um, industries, I'm just wondering what are some signs that we could look out for to possibly help others that, you know, may be exhibiting some behaviors that we should be aware of? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, you know, and I think um, there are lots of signs and symptoms and, and that being said, it's also hard to say, oh, if you see this, this, and this, it means somebody is struggling with suicidal thoughts. Um, it's not sort of a, a, a recipe or prescription for how that could end. But in general, um, you might hear people that are sort of saying different things. You know, they certainly may mention suicide, mention feeling like dying, or I can't do this anymore. Um, I wish I were dead. It's obviously not not often that clear. And, and even if somebody does say that, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily suicidal. Sometimes people get overwhelmed. They have certain phrases, words they use, but certainly listening out for what people are saying or how they might be talking. Um, people may be expressing a sense of helplessness or hopelessness. You might kind of hear that in interactions with them or in their language, um, or even talking about, um, you know, feeling like a burden, feeling trapped, they're, they're no good or a burden or a failure. Um, whether that's perceived uh, or there is some truth to that, maybe they've lost a job or have sort of uh, not succeeded at something, but in their own head, they can just sort of feel much worse than, than the reality. Mm -hmm. um, or you know, uh, might hear people describing or talking about pain, unbearable pain, um, and that could be physical pain, that could be emotional pain. Um, certainly, I think within the kind of construction or agricultural industry, sort of injuries and pain and the physical uh, physicality of the, the work is a real thing and that's a real kind of risk factor, so to speak. Um, but in addition to people talking about things, you certainly may be um, seeing and noticing different changes, maybe more so in behaviors. Um, so uh, may, may see people changing um, in drug or alcohol use, more increasing use of substances. People could be more isolated, um, uh, just kind of withdrawing themselves from those around them, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, things like that, um, or even kind of you know, saying goodbye to people, um, giving things away, kind of making sort of arrangements, hmm. which kind of a catch-22, you know, if somebody were sort of making funeral arrangements or end of life or pre-planning things like that, it feels like a responsible thing to do. Right. And um, after somebody may die, or if they were to die uh, by suicide, then we might look back and say, oh, I wonder if this was a plan, you know, hindsight being 2020. Um, so again, uh, kind of an example of these are things that we might see people doing, notice behavior changes. And that doesn't mean they are suicidal, but are often highly correlated with somebody that is more at risk or thinking about suicide. Um, and I also, you know, want to make mention of uh, people's moods. You often would see a change in their mood, most commonly depression, um, more sadness or depression, increase in anxiety. Um, that would not be uncommon. Expressing a loss of interest in things, um, you know, just not, not as engaged as, as they once were. Um, sometimes people may be struggling with a sense of uh, shame or even humiliation. You know, maybe something has happened in their life and they're just are really kind of taking that on and are 
uh, just don't feel like they can face anybody with what's gone on or what's happened. Um, and sometimes uh, you, you might see people that are um, struggling more with sort of a sense of anger or agitation. Mm. Um, and then this may seem counterintuitive, but sometimes people who have been struggling for a while, you might see a sudden change or um, in any, like basically they're doing better. They seem to be a sense of relief or kind of an improvement in their mood and in their functioning. So that seems like good news and oftentimes it is, but if somebody were maybe thinking about or struggling with suicidal thoughts and has now finally made the decision to end their life, sometimes they experience a sense of relief of sort of kind of seeing a way out of it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we've heard that after shortly before somebody has died by suicide that they suddenly seemed better and it really caught people off guard. Tony, if we were, you know, as a coworker or a manager or even a friend or family member, if we were to notice signs mm. like this in someone, where are some places that we could either, I guess maybe a better question is, how is a good way to share resources with a person like this? Mm -hmm. And maybe what are some resources that we ourselves, you know, as observers, mm -hmm. Because yeah. we'll struggle with some feelings too. Sure. Um, you know, what are some resources for us as well? Yep. It's a great question. I mean, I think the important thing to know is that there is help out there. There are resources out there, but it can be confusing to kind of figure out where. Where yeah. do I look? Where do I begin? Especially if I'm struggling myself. You know, I think obviously just it starts by talking. Some people opening up a little bit. You know, I think it's hard for people to open up and say that they're having a tough time or struggling. Um, but the idea of kind of just sucking it up or suffering in silence, it's not very helpful and doesn't generally work for people. Things just kind of stay and get worse and kind of get bigger within them. Um, so reaching out, you know, if that's friends, or family members, somebody that you trust to just kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm not doing well. And maybe that is kind of utilizing people that you don't know, you know, kind of more mm -hmm. formalized resources or confidential services. Um, most, uh, I think all communities have local mental health resources, a simple Google search um, will kind of pull up a variety of options right there in that geographic area. And I'm sure if people did that, what one of the things that would pop up would be 988, which is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. This is something that's been around for decades. It's so similar to calling 911 for a medical emergency, 988 became sort of a shortcut to the suicide and crisis hotline. Um, so if people were to reach out and call 988, it's gonna be answered by a real person. Um, it's gonna be answered in the state that they're calling from, sort of mm -hmm. locally, so that it's as close to kind of home as it can be, and kind of recognizing maybe the unique cultures and resources in, within that area of the mm -hmm. country. Um, it's for everybody, all ages. It's a uh, mental health and substance use crisis line. Um, and 988 is, you know, not only phone calls, but people can text 988 and still get the same response locally. Mm -hmm. They can also get onto the website. They can chat through a keyboard and, and access support that way. 24-7, confidential, free, no charge for the services. And they're going to be connected with a trained crisis counselor who's going to kind of assess their risk, what's going on, but just to help them work to understand what's happening for them in their unique situation. And then kind of work with them to sort of hopefully steer them in the direction of some resources that could be available. I think another great thing about 98 is that it's, um, it supports a lot of people who are worried about somebody else. So you don't have to be the one in crisis or struggling yourself, but you're worried about a friend, a family member, or a colleague. Um, you can reach out and sort of say, hey, I'm worried about my coworker. This is what I'm seeing. And then there'd be somebody to kind of guide you through that and help you know what to look for maybe, and then how to point you in the direction of some resources. Um, and you know, I don't want to discount, um, you know, your own, uh, the medical community, people's primary care offices or primary care providers. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes they have mental health uh, social workers or providers embedded right in the doctor's office because people, tend to be more comfortable seeking out a physician or a doctor if they have something medical going on. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had a back pain, I wouldn't probably hesitate to go and see a, a doctor. Mm -hmm. But if I'm having sort of brain pain, right. <laughs> or you know, you know, my, my, uh, I'm not feeling so great mentally, or I'm more depressed or anxious or not sleeping, sometimes people aren't um, as quick to reach out for that help, but they may mention that to their doctor mm -hmm. in passing. So to be able to sort of 
make that connection or warm handoff right in the doctor's office can be really helpful. Um, are there some other risk factors that kind of play that we should just generally be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I certainly have been talking about maybe some signs, some symptoms that one might see. And, and in general, again, written, there are broad risk factors, um, things like gender. It's men. Mm. Men are way more likely to die by suicide than women are. Women may attempt more frequently than men, but men uh, make fatal attempts and die at much higher rates than women. Um, you know, age makes a difference. Generally, the older one gets, the more their suicide risk goes up. So fortunately, mm. it's very low in young children. But with each growing age bracket, you know, if you go in, say, 10-year brackets, that suicide risk just increases. So honestly, the highest, uh, most at-risk demographic in our country is old white guys. Mm. Uh, gen um, not only is gender, but ethnicity makes a difference. You know, any kind of marginalized group or population has higher risk factors, um, whether it be yeah, um, you know Native Americans, Indigenous people, um, you know our veteran community. Any veterans out there are always been at higher risk, unfortunately. No one has a magic answer. I get that, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, any thoughts as to why the the rise or the increase in our mental health crises? You know. Uh, Worsening rates of, I think, substance use, alcohol use as a country. We're, we're not getting much better with that opiate epidemic. Yeah. I mean, people are kind of struggling in a lot of ways and they're self-medicating. And when you're using substances and alcohol, you're also kind of disinhibiting yourself in ways. And if you're already depressed and struggling and you're kind of pouring other substances on top of that, oftentimes mm -hmm. it can be a recipe for disasters and bad outcomes. Um, you know. Financially, people are struggling more and more. That is not really getting any easier for people. I think those right. divides, um, those income divides in our country, people are struggling with just the basics of you know food insecurity, housing insecurity. Um, so there's just a lot of kind of factors that I think all sort of stack up for different people that just mm -hmm. make it make the day to day harder. Honestly, the CDC estimates that about. Uh, both attempts and uh, suicide deaths annually cost the United States about $70 billion per year. Wow. So this is a huge public health issue, public yeah. health crisis, um, as well as economic for sure. I'm curious, before we get to the point of needing mm -hmm. resources, how do we do a little preventive care and take better care of ourselves? You know, self-care, it's easy to talk about, it's harder to do, and mm -hmm. I think even as mental health professionals, we, you know, we're good at looking out for and, and helping others out and offering advice, but we often aren't so good at heeding that advice ourselves. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, it still comes back to some of that sort of keeping your eyes open, you know, not only for your disease. If we're not good at looking out for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, we're probably better at watching others around us. So if everybody's subscribed to that, at least somebody else is watching you if you're not so good right. at it and kind of checking in on you. Um, but uh, you know, I think oftentimes it is just sort of recognizing the, the pace of life itself, of you know, work stressors, family stressors, financial stressors, they're real things and they take their toll on us. Um, you know, mental health and physical health, they're all intertwined. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of put them as completely separate buckets or silos is not very helpful. Um, you know, the, what what physical, what emotional stress can do to the physical body is mm -hmm. very well documented and, and it goes both ways. And we've kind of recognized that um, yeah. mental health is equally as important as physical health and there is no shame, there is no stigma um, in sort of seeking help and reaching out for help and support. I know for even myself, putting boundaries around how much time I spend on social media, yep. you know, using my phone and putting it down and gardening or walking or mm -hmm. doing things with friends and family make yeah. me feel better. Yep. Um, all those endorphins get released when you work out. So Absolutely. it kind of works hand in hand yeah. there. Um, but when I do look at social media, it's nice to see people talking about mental health mm -hmm. care because I think the more we talk about it and realize it's just a natural part of being human. Humans are messy, emotions are messy, but this is the reality. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can just kind of embrace that and just sort of recognize that like, 
you know, life is hard. And so how do we work within that and support each other um, and still find those ways to connect in real time with real people? I, you mentioned getting out for a walk, exercise, those things, you know, sound like basic things, but they're so, so important just as mm -hmm. eating, getting enough eating, sleeping, drinking, you know, right. the very basics that we need to kind of function as people are there for a reason. They're basics because they have to be there. It's okay to not be okay. Let's, let's sort of make it okay to talk about that helps decrease stigma. Mm -hmm. That helps sort of normalize the things that all of us are going through. Regardless of where we work or what kind of job we have, we all have struggles. So let's not pretend that everything's perfect and you're you're odd or you're weak or you're less than mm -hmm. if you're not feeling the best that you can feel. Let's get you some support, let's get you some help, and when you're not feeling alone, that in itself is a huge protective factor. Yeah, I think that's great advice, and I appreciate you helping us bring awareness to our audience. Sure. Um, we love our industry, and we love the people we work with, and want to do whatever we can to help protect them. Absolutely.